Okay, so continuing on with the uh, textures today. First we have a question. The question is, uh, do any of the browsers support bump mapping? Well, uh, I don't think so, but I don't know. There, uh, there have been some experimental nodes proposed on there. Bump mapping is an advanced technique. It's somewhat similar to image textures. Uh, and, and you can see this if you use Blender or other tools and then try to export them back. Gee, where does my bump map go? Well, we don't typically do bump maps. It would be a specialty feature we'd want to look. What is a bump map? That's where you might have a flat polygon, but you give it... The bump map is like individual normals that change the way the surface reflects light so that it appears as if it's bumpy or it has some shape on it. So you can fake a flat polygon into looking, being drawn, being rendered as if it had some kind of additional 3D structure to it. So it can help in the realistic rendering of some objects. You can, you can also just put in more geometry, of course, too. So uh, if you wanted to do bump mapping, well, what I would do with that question is first I would look uh, I would do a search. So let's do X3D bump map and see if we find it. How to view a bump map. Okay, so somebody else asked this question and it's on our... How's it doing? It's on our uh, community uh, wiki page here. And looks like we could use a... Uh, Bump map JPEG. This doesn't look like it's to me like it's going to work. Let's see if we found a reply to this. Uh oh, interface itis. Where's my button for the reply? Don't see it. So this might be just a floating message without a reply. Does anybody see it here? On the bottom so, left, where is it? Post reply? Well, post reply would be for us to create a reply to it. So it looks to me like it's an unanswered question. Somebody else? Okay, here's one with some answers into, into uh, uh, fake bump mapping, different techniques where you might emulate it, and then they talk about bit management and Cortona. Cortona is a Vermal 97 browser. Bit management has the BS contact browser. I would add uh, instant reality as, as a likely place to find that. So you could just keep searching around. Obviously some people have done this, or we could post to the community mailing list. So let's do that. Uh, first, I'll, I'll show how to subscribe. And let's stick with the, the website, community, public email lists. And there we go, X3D public email list. You can sign up there. You can manually sign up. You can also go through the archives where you might find a past message that does it. And these have been archived since 2004. So let's just post. So I'm already a member. And so I'll just post a question out there. I wonder if any browsers support some kind of bump mapping capable capability. Okay, and we'll copy you folks in the class on this, and we'll see what we get. Okay, one of the neat things about using the mailing lists is that we often find uh, answers that can't be found otherwise. It's an active community. It uh, doesn't swamp your mailbox, but it does uh, bring a lot of experts in. There's a lot of people who are just listening on the mailing list, not active contributors, and uh, they're happy
happy to chime in on that stuff. So thanks for that question today, and we'll see where it goes. Okay, so image texture. Let's clear the decks here a little bit. All right, our texture nodes. We'll start at the beginning. If we go to the table of contents uh, for this chapter, we can link right there and get to uh, image texture node. Actually, uh, I think that jumped us a little too far ahead. Let's add another link in here. <clears throat> Bear with me. There we go. That's where we should really start. Texture nodes. We talked about that a little bit before we talked about image texture. So I'm going to name that slide and then put a link to that in the table of contents. Texture nodes, the text is texture nodes, apply, and there we go. So, all set. So, what are texture nodes all about? Well, this is where 2D meets 3D. Okay, and texture is the computer graphics, 3D graphics term for a plain old image, a 2D image. And so, we call them a texture because we don't use the image just by itself. It's flat, it's a 2D construct. Instead we say, we're gonna apply that image to some kind of geometry, stick it in the world, and uh, view it there. You know, it might be that we apply it to a flat box, or, or excuse me, a flat quadrilateral, and just stick it in the 3D world. But if, if you think about it, it's, it's no longer a 2D construct because 2D nodes, excuse me, 2D images are measured in pixels. How many pixels across are they? How many pixels high are they? They're just colored dots, picture elements in there. As soon as we put it into 3D, we have to give it some kind of size. So even if we put it on a quadrilateral that exactly makes matches the snapshot, we've given it some finite length, we've made it a polygon, it has to be positioned somewhere in 3D space or it can't be seen anymore, so it really is a 3D version of the 2D image. We can go past that, we can go farther and say, well, since it's 3D we're not constrained to flatland, we can wrap it around something, if that makes sense. Put those pixels, stretch them out, and see what it looks like. So this can be a very inexpensive way to get a fairly high fidelity image that otherwise would take a lot of work of individually polygonizing some geometry and then taking that tessellated geometry and applying a color here, a color here, a color there, a color there. That can take an awfully long time. So image texture, applying a 2D texture image is a fast way to do that. Now what we also see in this uh, chapter is that in addition to the basic technique of applying a 2D image texture, a 2D picture file, we can also use a thing called pixel texture, which is simply the definition of multiple pix pixels on a pixel by pixel, value by value basis. Okay, and then finally we have a, a third approach here, a movie texture, which says, well, a movie is also a 2D image, but it's changing over time. The image is varying whenever we play it, and it may vary at normal speed forward, or fast speed, or backwards, or, or just be stopped somewhere in that stream of images. But it's still viewed as a 2D image at any given moment. So we can take that movie and drape it on a geometry just as we would a plane.
plain old 2D paint. Once we get through those three, we'll see that there's also uh, ways to shift it around. We might say, well, we want to move it a little bit, we might rotate it, we might want to get certain points of the imagery correlating to certain parts of the geometry. And so texture transform, texture coordinate are two nodes that allow us to do that. Okay, so to, so to get down into the math a little bit, this is mostly definitional here. Say, if we are going to apply a 2D pixel-defined image to some piece of 3D geometry, we have to have a way to reference things. So uh, there's a, a long-honored uh, 3D graphics convention here called Texture Coordinate System. And uh, you can see different ways of doing this in, in different languages. For example, uh, uh, HTML measures from the top quarter down in pixels. Java measures from the top down. Uh, but I think uh, sometimes you see that they're oriented a different way. Some do height and width. Some do width and height. Others might do distance instead of pixels. The way we do it in 3D, because there are so many image coordinate systems on their own that might vary from system to system or format to format, we say we're just going to have one coordinate system to refer to an image. And uh, that's defined by two axes, S and T, corresponding to the, uh, uh, the bottom edge and the left edge, uh, respectively. So the bottom left corner is where we're measuring from, not the top left corner like HTML or some other coordinates. But we measure from down there and we don't measure it in pixels because we don't always know how many pixels there might be in an image. Instead, we simply have it at a normalized scale, 0 to 1. So you could say, oh, okay, well, this is, this is simply a function. This is a functional definition that maps any point on our image to a number coordinate. And that, that point may be a pixel. It may be right between two pixels. It may be our way of going that approximate area there. It may be just part of a pixel. Uh, that's fine. This is how we map to it. OK, so here's a picture that comes out of the uh, X3D specification. Uh, I think this was done by, uh, it was probably done by uh, Rick Carey and Gavin Bell or one of their teams way back in the uh, Open Inventor days. And a uh, nice example of just an arbitrary 2D image trying to illustrate different colors. And if you look on the sides, the key points here are, oh, there's the coordinate system. And there's how we measure it. Bottom left-hand corner is the origin. And if we need to point at any individual location on that image, they, we just refer to the S and T coordinate. So now we're completely independent. We don't care how many bytes it was, how many pixels it might have, what, whether it's aspect ratio, its width to height ratio was a given value, whether it was the same value as advertised, whether it changed at runtime. We just don't care anymore. We can just use the good old s and coordinate system. So if we look in um, X3D Edit, we'll find that uh, in this chapter, chapter 5, Appearance, Material, Textures, that we can go down in there and actually find that image is included in the book example. So let's find it here. OK, image texture. Figure 18.1. Oh, I guess that also tells you where to find it in the book. So there it is. That is a public domain image. So we dropped it in there. Let's uh, look at another example now. Actually, no. Let's just leave that as is and go back to the slots. Okay. So what else can we say that's common about these texture 2D images? Our primary parameters are whether it repeats. Now that we have a coordinate system for S and T, bottom left corner, we could say, oh, OK, do we repeat the image, tile it in one direction, or maybe both directions? 
So an obvious example here might be if you have a really nice picture of a brick and the brick maybe even has half spacing of mortar around it, then you could take that image and just say repeat in the T direction, in the S direction, repeat in the T direction, and you could wrap bricks all over your geometry, however big it is. Okay? So that's what those are about. And it starts at zero, zero from whatever is the origin of the geometry on its surface, which can vary a little bit. You have to read the fine points, so often that just doesn't matter. Now, here's a hint, though. And if, if this isn't on your slide, I have been tweaking the slides daily. You might want to update them periodically as we add things. Uh, usually, repeat S and repeat T are quite uh, helpful. But sometimes you want a little bit fancier patterns that computationally can get hard to define. So uh, there's a much better trick. And this is sort of in the category of uh, doctor, doctor, my arm hurts when I go like this. And the doctor says, uh, says well, don't, don't go like that. And then he usually has somebody else say, and, and here's your bill. But uh, uh, and under the category of don't do the part that hurts, instead of trying to do everything in 3D, it often makes more sense to do our image manipulation in 2D using 2D image manipulation programs like Photoshop or some people even use, dare I say it, uh, PowerPoint for some of these things or maybe Visio or um, there's some rudimentary but, but usually okay features in uh, uh, open office with several bugs posted on how they could do better uh, or my favorite or my favorite one to recommend would be uh, the GIMP and these are listed on the next slide and uh, uh, so I've listed these guys in here oh paint comes free if you've got a window system uh, I imagine Mac gives you a free uh, drawing tool is that correct yeah, what's the name of that? Um, okay, so so I, that wasn't just a, or you mean a Windows that? thing. Yeah, is there on, on on the Mac? Is there a free uh, image manipulation tool? Simple image editing. There's um, it's like PowerPoint. It's called uh, Well, I think with Mac, most people just use their brains and they think of what they want and the computer magically uh, determines it. We'll let you fill that in later for us, Jeff. The reason I, I recommend the GIMP is because it's free and it's open source and it pretty much has the same functionality or the, the same limitless functionality as uh, Photoshop, which is uh, the industry leader in this type of thing. Keynote. Keynote, okay. Big K or little K? Uh, big K. Okay, so you can get it from here. This means uh, if you're in a corporate environment or in a university, uh, you're not paying big bucks for it, you're not using some expensive tool that the license expires the day after you graduate. It is open source and it's come a long way over many years and does a lot of stuff. You can also get books and download manuals on it. So if you haven't yet learned an image tool but know you're going to need to, I would, I would definitely consider that. But given that you uh, know these tools or have a tool that you could use, however simple it might be, Okay, here's a, uh, a, a case in point for how we would modify an image. And sometimes what you want is not a brick where everyone looks the same, but you want an image that might be highly detailed, say a bunch of grass. 
and you want to lay that over something. And has anybody here tried laying grass or sky or ocean on top of things with repeat S, repeat T? Uh, Rich, did you pick up the baton on notes today, or who has notes okay. today? Uh, please put in the notes, let's get some counterexamples of how to do repeat S and repeat T poorly with grass or sky or something like that. So if somebody would like to make that their weekly project, I'd be happy to put it in the uh, archive. Go ahead. Just, uh, just for, as far as textures go, I know in our graphics class, mm -hmm. the tutors that they wanted that we used initially to, to show it, it's not like texture really, but it shows what happens when you manipulate S and T. And I just sent that out to Very good. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, th th these are consistent techniques I'm showing you here with uh, all the other 3D tools. The community is very consistent about this. So let's put in rather some, in, in addition to the good cases, let's put in some bad cases of common failure modes. Let's say you did have graphs and you wanted to spread it out. What it would look like if you just did repeat S and repeat T by themselves, would it look like, oh, here's a picture of grass and here's a picture of grass and here's a picture of grass. And it would be very obvious that you had done that because there would be seams between each one. The, the grass blades would not line up. So what this picture is showing you is a nice image manipulation trick where you can drop some arbitrary image like that that more or less looks the same. It's got some you know, artistic texture. It's got some repeating pattern that's more or less the same, but it's not exactly the same as the edges. So the trick to get the edges to line up is we take it and we copy it. But instead of just copying it as is, we flip it around. And then we copy that and flip that around. And you can see on the slide here how the one asymmetric image got flipped one way and then the other way so that if we look at any of the edges, either the four internal edges or the four external edges, they're all the same. And so now when you do repeat S, repeat T on this quad image, this four times as big image, you will not get those line artifacts between them, but it will look exactly smooth. Now, I'm not saying it'll be perfect. You might, at that point, you might still look at it and say, well, I do see a pattern still. You know, there's a blob here, a blob there, and I can see repeating blobs everywhere, such as with this one. Okay, well, what do you want for nothing? But uh, uh, that usually is telling you maybe your image wasn't quite as uniform as possible. Maybe it's time to go back out to your front lot yard, take another picture of the grass where it's consistent rather than having dirt in one corner, and uh, take another picture of the water from the bridge where it looks reasonably consistent across it. If it's something like water where you have a larger pattern instead of grass or, or a fabric, then you might need to crop it a different way or just say, I don't want waves. I just want a calm flat surface where it's all about the same pixel consistency. And then this technique works very nice. Okay, so it took us uh, four or five minutes to describe that and that hopefully saves somebody hours of agony trying to do it the uh, other way. Okay, we're now ready to jump into where the rubber hits the road on this guy and that would be the image texture node. This is again one of our workhorse nodes. If, if material is the primary way that you uh, color things, image texture would be the, the second most important, how we draw things. And so this is where we actually define and retrieve a file and apply it to the geometry. So it is important to master. Okay, now it does have a field in it. The primary field would be URL. And we've seen this guy before. Uniform Resource Locator. This has uh, been used in Inline and Anchor, and this is the uh, address of where you would get the file. Just as we saw before, in X3D, that's not a singleton value. That can be multiple values. In fact, it's an ordered list, meaning multiple values which if it doesn't find the first, it'll go to the second. If it doesn't find the second, it'll go to the third, and so on. 
until it gets something. That means you shouldn't put a grab bag of images in there unless that's what you want. Maybe your image <coughs> is actually a, a detector where the first image says server one online and the second image says server two online, server one failed, the third image, etc. You might do that, but that would be highly irregular. Usually each image is the same or perhaps different resolutions of the same picture as a backdrop. There's uh, an interesting trick you can play on this one, and that is uh, normally when people do this, if I can get my pen to draw, I'll get on the right screen, that'd be good. Ordinarily, we point to the local version first because it's most efficient. If you're reading it off your local disk, read the image right next to it. You're reading it off the server, read the image right next to it. You don't have to do all sorts of address resolution. But occasionally you might want to do an online version first. For example, if, if we were doing some kind of cloud cover, weather report, or visualizing what the weather of the day was, you might preferentially go to the server and say, what is my weather shot for today for this location? And then if that one fails, fall back to a local standby image, which could say, you know, my clear sunny day sky picture. Okay, so this is how you might achieve time of day effects that were network aware, web capable. Okay, so let's look at the example. And uh, we don't have a special example in here because we're going to use our uh, perhaps our most favorite file. I know it's in here somewhere. Let's just open it up. It's at the end of the uh, should be at the end of the list for this for the book. I went up out of the chapters into the top level for the course archive, and there it is. Our old favorite. Hello world. Oh yeah, hello world. We had a picture of the globe in there. So let's open that up. And we can see in the editor here that we've listed not one, but multiple guys. This is pretty hard to read. If we look at the source code, and mess around with that, we see, oh yeah, same as before, we've got multiple quoted values, each of which is an independent URL in itself, each of which could work. If we want to test whether those actually work, then there's a way to do that. And there's actually a Navy slogan for this, uh, you get what you inspect, not what you expect. So if you want, if you want to, if you want to make sure it works, you should test it. So, so what we can do is let's do this little trick here: export from X3D as annotated HTML. All right. So I do that. Hello world. Yeah, that's the one we want. And we'll save it as hello world.html. And do we want to overwrite the existing one? Sure. And then. There's the source, and here it is popped into the browser. And oh yeah, we've been here before. The tool has linked each one of these. So now we can manually go through and click on each one. That was earthtopo.png. Now we have earthtopo.jpg, earthtoposmall.gif. So if you wanted to preferentially go to a large or a small, you could do that. If you wanted to cover which image format did my browser support? Here we've covered all the bases, got the three major ones, and then we've covered the bases further by saying there's the online version. Oh, my server's working and the file is up there and my file name is correct. I didn't make a capitalization mistake. If I capitalize the E in Earth and look for this image again, should get, we're so sorry your image isn't there. Could we possibly help you further? Answer, no, we just need to have the right 
image name. Okay, now I'm going to show you guys a new feature which I hope to get rippled through into uh, that image texture editor maybe by the end of the week. So by the time somebody sees this video, this will probably already be embedded. But what we've done is a um, We've done a, a much improved URL editor. So we'll look at another node. This is a node we haven't really studied yet. We've seen it once or twice. So uh, don't worry about the node itself. What I want to show you is the, U, the new improved URL editor we have here. So uh, here you can see it's actually listed as a list instead of some stupidly wrapping um, uh, <coughs> text area and we can further uh, uh, open it. We can add URLs, we can subtract them, and in the next version, the version we hope to get out here, there will be three more buttons on your URL editor. One will be first to edit it, and it gives you a choice of is it HTTP or SFTP or something. Then the second button choice is uh, launch it in the browser, so you can test to see that it's there. The third choice it gives you will be load it into X3D Edit. So it might be that you want to not only check the file you're referring to, but modify it. Okay? So stay tuned for that feature, uh, and I think you'll find that makes it much easier to edit and check and improve your URLs. Okay. So what's next? We've seen how to flip images around. We've seen how to list files in our image texture node. Yeah, what was that stuff about multiple formats? Well, here are the formats that we not only support but require. By require, that means browsers must support. JPEG, and PNG, Portable Network Graphics. And um, there's a little more pros in the notes here. I think I'll go ahead and add, I'll add some links too to where these specifications are found. These are actually formal specifications for these image formats for tools to do them right. Just like in X3D, they've got a file with spec. Now, why are those two required? Well, for a couple of reasons. One is they're free, meaning you can use them for any purpose without a license. You can also get software pretty easily for people who want to implement it, either to edit these files or to create them. Some of that software is free, too. And then finally, they're required so that you, as an author, don't have to think so hard about what what uh, images your end user might see. If we gave you 10 optional formats, then we'd have to start making optional copies and coverages, just like we did in the uh, X3D edit example here, where we had a PNG and a JPEG and a GIF versions of it. It's much easier to just say, ah, use the PNG version, I'm all done. Or use the JPEG version, I'm all done. Now, a good checkpoint on that is if you look at JPEG, you see that that format was really defined for photos, where you can have lots and lots and lots of different colors in each pixel. PNG is a little bit better for computer drawings, where uh, the colors tend to be more consistent. Okay, so PNG can get uh, very, very small because it's efficient at handling a few colors. JPEG is very good at not only dealing with lots of colors, but doing lossy compression that's imperceptible. In other words, reducing the file size, but it still looks just as good. Okay, so if you're trying to decide which to use, PNG for drawings, JPEG for photos. That would be your choice. And then you're done. Just use one or the other. You don't have to put alternate versions in. Because it's required, 
You could also read that as guaranteed support. What else? We included GIF, but made it only recommended. And there's an interesting story behind this. There used to be the biggest story on the web, and now is maybe lost in the mist of time. Um, when people first started doing HTML web pages, most of the images, perhaps all of the images out there for a while, were GIF format, graphics interchange format. It's pretty good format. It looks good. It's reasonably small. Other formats would be in it, but it, it works just fine. Now, uh, what happened was after a number of years went by, at least five years went by, company called Unisys announced, gee, one of our lawyers was working late, and I'm not sure what late is on lawyer terms, I think that's like after two in the afternoon or something, after tea time maybe, or before happy hour somewhere. And one of the lawyers found, my goodness, we own a patent that is a controlling piece of intellectual property that you could not make a GIF piece of software without using our patented algorithm. And we're so happy about that, we're going to charge royalty fees for anybody who uses GIF. Oh my goodness, what an uproar there was at that point. Because people said, what are you doing? You're going to break the web here. We've been using all this. We can't afford royalties on every image. And after a few months of uproar, they came back, OK, OK, wait a minute. We, we don't want to make everybody mad. We'll just charge royalties on software tools that implement it. So authors doing their own little web page don't have to worry about it. Well, sorry, the cat was out of the bag, and there were enough people irritated and aggravated by this. They did what was then considered an almost unheard of thing, which was, let's invent around it. Let, let's not only meet it, but let's beat it. Let's make a better format and we'll avoid their silly patents, and we'll, we'll come up with better algorithms and make it royalty-free from the ground up. Some people said it was impossible. Some people got to work. What did they call the result? PNG, Portable Network Graphics, which by almost every metric is considered superior to GIF. So there's a little history lesson that, no, we don't have to stay subject to corporations when it comes to web technology, we can figure out ways to work it. Now, please don't mishear me. I'm not saying that intellectual property is bad. I'm not saying that people shouldn't make money on, on their inventions. Those are all good. I'm not saying money is evil. Others might say that. I don't, I don't say that. But interestingly, for you as an X3D author, not only do you have two always supported choices and one probably supported choice because it doesn't cost you anything and browsers can toss it in. In, 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 you know, in retrospect, the GIF licensing, I mean, it might even be gone today. I'm not sure, but it's cheap. A lot of people support it. But better than all that, we say, vive la difference any image format. So if you have something that you really want to use, that you really care about, great, use it. But put it first. So that might be a TIFF, that might be another specialty format, and if you know that your end browser, that the 3D software that's rendering it will work, okay, fine, it will preferentially take that. And if anybody else gets it there, plain vanilla, spec compliant, and no further browser will say, uh, gee, I didn't understand that first one. What do you got next? And it will just drop down to the next entry in the list and find something. Okay, so there's the long way around on a fairly short story. We've got some good choices here. And uh, as an author, you benefit directly from this. Okay, perhaps a fine point here. Uh, well, what if you have both image texture and material? Are there any interactions between those two techniques? Okay, first off, 
since you might be on a slow link, if you're waiting for the image to come down but the geometry is there, if you don't have a material it will just appear as gray. But if your item is predominantly one color or you want to distinguish it, it's a good practice It's a good practice to give it a material note so that it has some color. So it's not so jarring when the image snaps into place after it's already loaded. Okay? And that's what the careful choice of diffuse color can help you with. And in certain cases, your pixel texture, excuse me, your image texture might have some transparent pixels in there. When you look at some images on web pages, for example, they don't have square edges. They're just some shape because the surrounding texture has an alpha channel, has a transparency bit set against it, partial or complete. Oh, just like we did with material. So if you do have an image that has red, green, blue, alpha component to it, meaning transparency as well as color, then you probably do want to make a deliberate choice as to what the underlying material color is, and it's probably not going to be gray. It's probably going to be black or white or whatever the background is that you would want to show through. It might simply be transparent, okay? Because if you recall, our default transparency on the material is not one for transparent, but zero for opaque. So if you say, well, I don't want it to be gray, I don't want it to be black, I don't want it to be white, I want it to be transparent, it's a transparent pixel, okay, fine. Put that material right next to it and make it transparent. Okay, there we go on image texture. Covered a lot of ground, it's an important node. Hope you're feeling enabled at this point. Okay, so we're going to move on through movie texture and pixel texture in our next lesson. See you later.